Hi, I'm Bob Orr, and this is Washington Unplugged. Today we're talking about the U.S. space program. After five failed attempts, Shuttle Endeavor finally lifted off last evening. Meanwhile, today marks the 40th anniversary of the launch of Apollo 11, the historic mission to the moon in 1969. We're going to talk to Buzz Aldrin, the second man to step on the moon, in just a moment. But first, let's go to CBS Space Analyst Bill Harwood. He's at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Bill, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Bob. Uh, I saw last night in your notes that uh, when Endeavor lifted off, there was uh, an uncommon uh, bits of debris, a large uh, amount of debris that came off. Is this a problem? It's really too soon to say. You know, they always expect a little bit of foam insulation to come off the external tank. There's nothing really they can do about that. What they've tried to do since the Columbia accident six years ago, of course, is minimize the amount of debris. If it makes sure if stuff comes off, it's small and causes no real damage. Uh, during the launch, as you say, we saw multiple debris events. Quite a bit of foam came off the tank. Uh, some of that could have been due to lighting. We might, it might have been coming off all along. We never saw it before. Uh, but this did look unusual to my untrained eye anyway. And there are at least a couple of places where it clearly caused some damage to the, to the heat shield tiles on the belly of the orbiter. Uh, the real question is, is it serious damage? Uh, they're going to be doing their normal inspections over the next two days, and they'll certainly find that out. Uh, right now, it's too soon to say. It's just something they're looking at. After Columbia, we, of course, always worry about that. The crew's been made aware of this, but I don't get any sense that NASA's all that concerned yet. They're not. You know, it's just one of those things that it's, it's really, you know, it happens over and over again. Things happen, it looks bad, and then as you get into it and look at it a little bit more, it might not be as bad as it looks. They, they withhold judgment on these things until they get the data, and that's, that's the smart thing to do. Uh, when the shuttle approaches the space station on Friday, they'll do that backflip maneuver. The guys on the station will take pictures of those tiles with very powerful cameras, and whatever damage is there, they'll see it. And if they need to, they can do some repairs. But right now, I think it's kind of wait and see. So this is another mission to the International Space Station. Now, we're pretty much running up against the clock here because the shuttle program's over in 2010, right? That's right. At the end of next year, the program ends. There's seven more flights planned after this one. And, of course, they really need to get up as much spare parts as they can, supplies as they can, uh, to keep the station going after the shuttle stops. I don't know that most Americans realize uh, that without the shuttle, major components can't get to the station. The Russians have uh, rockets, of course, that carry cosmonauts and, and small amounts of supplies, but for really big stuff, they need the shuttle. So NASA's plan between now and the end is to launch major components, spare gyroscopes, spare cooling assemblies, you know, big units that if they fail later, they want to have them on the station, prepositioned, ready to be installed, uh, because there isn't going to be anything to carry them up. That's, that's kind of the, the near-term goal of these flights is to supply and resupply the station. So the shuttle program winds down, uh, and then what comes next? I guess we're into kind of a dark hole in the space program for at least a couple of years, but what's on the horizon? Well, what NASA's trying to do is implement the Bush administration's vision for space exploration. This is something uh, the Bush administration announced back in 2004. Uh, they ordered NASA to complete the space station and retire the shuttle by 2010, or the end of 2010, and then to use the money that had been going into both those programs, more than $4 billion a year, uh, to build a new set of rockets. Uh, Na NASA calls them Ares. Uh, there's an Ares-1 rocket that will launch a crew capsule, kind of like a big Apollo capsule, uh, to low Earth orbit. And then eventually NASA wants to build a big heavy lift rocket uh, that would launch a lunar lander. So you'd, you'd launch the crew on this Ares-1 rocket. The capsule would dock with the lander that was launched by the big unmanned rocket. They both go off to the moon. And somewhere around 2020, uh, NASA would hope to establish permanent bases uh, on the moon. Now, whether, whether the government will pay for that, a big unknown. Uh, the Obama administration has ordered a review of NASA's manned space program. Uh, they're going to come back sometime in August, and they'll weigh in on what policy makes the most sense. Uh, until then, it's like you said, it really is up in the air. Uh, NASA's marching down the road for a moon program, but it's not clear yet that the government's going to give them the money to do it. And I know NASA's using this week, the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11, to remind people that they've done heroic things. This is kind of a PR initiative, I think. Well, it really is. You know, I mean, you can't take anything away from Apollo 11. I mean, that's one of those events that 500 years from now, when there's two or three paragraphs written about the 20th century, Apollo 11 is going to be there. Uh, it, it truly was a remarkable event, and it's something that is worth remembering 40 years later, uh, if for nothing else, just, just to remember that they actually did this. Uh, when you look at how difficult it is to do anything in space, imagining going to the moon with capsules using computers that really didn't have the computing horsepower of a modern cell phone, uh, it's, it's really staggering they were able to pull it off and not have any accidents along the way on the moon. 
All right. Well, Bill, thanks uh, for taking a few minutes this morning. I know we'll be watching for updates on the, whether this debris problem is a problem or not. Absolutely, Bob. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bill Harwood again at the Kennedy Space Center. Well, Buzz Aldrin became an instant worldwide celebrity 40 years ago this week when he and fellow astronaut Neil Armstrong became the first two men ever on the moon. Dr. Aldrin's at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to mark the anniversary of that triumphant mission. And a short time ago, I asked him what he's doing to celebrate. Well, we're here in uh, sunny uh, Florida at the Kennedy Space Center, wonderful Saturn V uh, museum. Uh, and it's just beginning uh, uh, talking to uh, quite a few people around the world, or around the country anyway. And I'm about to be joined by a number of other uh, Apollo astronauts who were down here to celebrate the liftoff. Uh, just about exactly uh, uh, 40 years ago today, uh, and it's kind of the beginning of uh, uh, a week-long uh, set of activities, uh, and then some international uh, celebrations uh, over in Europe. Uh, but it's quite a, uh, 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 a reunion type of activities, bringing uh, the crew together in, in Washington, D.C., a few days from now and uh, we hope to uh, visit with the president and have some wonderful celebrations. You've been asked about this for 40 years. So much has been written about Apollo 11 and the historic mission. Do you ever get tired of talking about it? Uh, no, I think it's a good idea to uh, keep sharing it with uh, new generations that come along. Uh, we, we, uh, we're happy to uh, give them an additional history lesson uh, in addition to the greatest generation that came along during World War II. We think the great uh, opportunities that came along for us to uh, expand our horizons of exploration uh, with the challenge to uh, send a man to the moon, bring it back safely. Uh, it it ju just helped to end the Cold War and helped to uh, uh, open up exploration throughout the world. Talk to me a little bit, if you could, about uh, those few minutes you spent on the moon when you first arrived there with Neil Armstrong. As you mentioned, it was the height of the Cold War. Vietnam was going on. Uh, it fulfilled a promise the president had made. Did you feel like a hero at that moment? No, not at all. We felt like very fortunate people being given the opportunity to be responsible, uh, alert, and, uh, and to carry out uh, our, our task to the very best of our ability, being uh, just uh, uh, enjoying what we're doing, but also paying very close attention to our once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that uh, just came along. So uh, fortunately for, uh, for the three of us and for all of the people of Apollo uh, who, who were able to share uh, in, in this uh, uh, really earth-changing opportunity of opening up exploration throughout the universe. Was there a moment, though, when you're there and you're looking down, and I can't even imagine what that view must look like, where you just thought, wow, this is really cool. I'm, I'm the luckiest guy. Well, you know, as uh, my, my hometown, when I moved out, Yogi Berra moved in, and it's never over till it's over. So uh, there was a lot left uh, to, uh, to, to successfully complete the mission. We had to leave the Earth. We had to rendezvous. We had to land back uh, in the ocean. Uh, and, and then uh, the celebrations began around the world. So uh, it was, it was a really uh, a, a very momentous uh, time period for us as uh, individuals and, and for the world. Are you concerned at all, though, uh, in the 40 years since, that the interest in the space program has flagged a bit? Uh, the shuttle program didn't really capture the imagination of all that many people. Of course, we had the twin tragedies there. And now there's a very uncertain future for NASA. What, what are you worried about? Well, uh, Apollo was such a pioneering effort. It was never intended to be sustaining presence on the moon, and, and we had to uh, terminate that at the right time, six out of seven successful landings, and, and we, uh, we, we chose to move on uh, and, and uh, define a, a new program of reusable uh, spacecraft anyway uh, with the space shuttle. Took a little longer than we thought it would, didn't quite live up to expectations, but we defined the space station, and uh, we're now completing that. We've got six people up at the International Space Station, and, uh, and we've only got three orbiters left, so it's, it's time to move on back into exploration. And, uh, and I think right now, with the new administration, 
we are wisely reevaluating the path that uh, we've we've chosen and to see whether uh, we need to revise that in some way and I think we need to conserve our launch resources with with one launch vehicle instead of two and that'll allow us to maybe follow the shuttle with the US International Mini Shuttle landing on a runway and, and enable us to uh, alter the course so we can help the other international nations uh, land their humans on the moon with their resources while we chart a course, a pathway, a progressive optimistic pathway uh, to uh, presence, human presence on the planet Mars. Now it's going to take probably two decades or, or a little more to carry that out, uh, but I think it's a very exciting period where once we develop long duration life support uh, equipment at the space station, those exploration modules can then fly by uh, comets, uh, station keep with, uh, with Orion uh, at uh, asteroids, uh, look, look at uh, even Earth-threatening asteroids like uh, Apophis. And, and then uh, send uh, uh, the exploration module to uh, the moon of Mars, Phobos, occupy it for several times over a period of five or six years before we actually touch down on the surface of Mars. It's truly exciting opportunity, and, and I hope to share this with many people uh, so that we can uh, embark on a very challenging, optimistic pathway for the future. All right, Dr. Buzz Aldrin, thanks very much for taking a few minutes this morning. Thank you. And thank you for watching Washington Unplugged. Join us again tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. right here on cbsnews.com. For now, I'm Bob Orr. Have a good day.